Hi, everybody. Welcome to Humane Voices. Carrie here, as always. Um, we have a really interesting newsworthy topic for you today. Um, we have re recently released um, what, what has become an annual list of a hundred terrible puppy mills around the country. And and every every year our, our puppy mill teams puts together this list. And it's a real challenge of of sort of data sourcing and and going through a whole bunch of records that at times can be really challenging to get. Um our guest today is Kathleen Summers, the director of outreach and research for the Puppy Mills campaign. Um Ka Kathleen, I mean, I know you've been doing this for a long time. Congratulations. Welcome to the show. Um and, and can't wait to talk to you about it. Thanks. So, I mean, one of the things we always have to sort of get out of the way when we talk about the horrible hundred is, you know, we have to say, you know, for for both legal and practical practicality reasons, this is not the list of the hundred worst puppy mills out there, right? And can you talk about why it's not that list? Sure. I mean, these are definitely puppy mills where animals are being mistreated and we have severe concerns about them. But we can't call it the list of the worst puppy mills because we haven't seen all the puppy mills. There there are about 10,000 puppy mills in the country, and many of them aren't required under the law to be inspected at all. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows what goes on there. Right. So there could be stuff out there that we haven't seen that no one's even getting a real look at, right? Right. Or yeah. in some cases, they're even under active investigation and we can't report on them. Mm -hmm. And we've been, I mean, you. how long have you been directly involved in doing this report now? Every year that we, every year we put it out. So 11 years. Oh, wow. Okay. So we've been doing this for 11 years now. Um, so we can't say that these are the absolute worst of the worst because it's possible there are worse things that we can't even see. But what we can say is that there is sort of a trend, trends we can identify in where some of these like really bad breeders are located. And so you see this kind of year after year in terms of trends around particular states. And so maybe we could talk through, you know, it's kind of like in, in, in a way, it's kind of the hall of shame where particular states, I think, make a kind of frequent annual appearance on this list. And so maybe we could sort of sort of do a, a counting backwards to like the number one, which in this case is not a good place to be. Right, right. And the number one in our report for 11 years running has been Missouri. Interesting. It's the biggest puppy mill state in the country. Okay. So well let maybe let's let's start um let's start with the we'll do sort of the top the top worst three states. So like what's what's the the third worst state for puppy mills in in terms of the data that y'all have gathered? So we had a tie this year between New York and Kansas. Mm -hmm. Um and both of those places are you know big farming communities there so they tend to have a lot of breeders. Mm -hmm. Um and then for second place we had Iowa and Ohio were tied, mm -hmm. uh, but far, far surpassing them was Missouri, which had more than 30 breeders in the report. And Missouri has been encompassing about a third of our report for the entire 11 years that we've been putting out this report. Wow. So that's incredible. So can you talk, are there consistencies that you see in terms of like what, what makes, what drives these states? Um, what, dr what drives the, the bad statistics in these states? Like, are there are there sort of commonalities that they share in terms of laws, in terms of like what what's what's causing that? Well, you know, the states that do have a lot of farmland tend to have a lot of dog breeding facilities, mm -hmm. um, and some states, paradoxically, are in the report uh, to a larger extent because they actually have broader inspection programs. Mm, mm -hmm. So um, as as horrible as Missouri is, unfortunately, for dogs, there's so many puppy mills there. There's probably just as many, almost just as many puppy mills, probably right over the border in Arkansas. Mm. But because they don't have a state law that regulates dog breeders, oh, wow. we have no reports to look at for Arkansas except USDA reports, which there's a different criterion for those. Right. So this sort of plays into the a sort of similar question about why we can't say these are the worst of the worst. Like Right, right. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to say, um, oh, these puppy mills are okay are are only kind of bad. They are bad. And mm -hmm. and we're finding dogs there that have you know bloody wounds and emaciated dogs, um, breeders that destroyed puppies that they felt they couldn't sell. Like horrible things are happening at these horrible hundred facilities. Mm -hmm. But 
what's even more sad is right over the border, there's unfortunately probably just as many bad ones the next state over, but they may not be in our report because we just don't have the documentation mm-hmm. and we, we don't put things in the report just based on hearsay. So we've been we've been sort of putting this report together for a while now. Like, so it seems like every year when the report comes out that there are times when it results in some closures of like, or, or it gets some attention to the mills that have really sort of put the state on, on that list. Like what have you seen in terms of sort of results over time? Like, like that the, that the horrible hundred report has helped sort of shine a spotlight on some of these places. Well, I think it's very helpful that people can do a Google search on a name and mm-hmm. see sometimes if they pop up. Um, now, when somebody's looking to buy a puppy, hopefully they're searching. Um, definitely every problem breeder is not going to be on the list. Yeah. But um, last year we did have an incident where a humane law for- law enforcement officer was looking into a puppy mill and he did do a search online. He found our report and he found that this puppy mill had been in our report several times. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were direct quotes in there from the inspection reports And that was able to give him enough information to get a warrant to go on the property. And that puppy mill was shut down and the dogs were all rescued. So that, that, you know, as hard as it is to put out the report and read about the animal cruelty, uh, instances like that really make us feel like it was worthwhile. Wow. Yeah. So when you're putting this list together, um, like what are some of the things that you that that you or the inspectors have found at these properties that let, that secure these places, the kind of like place in their hall in the hall of shame? Like what kind of conditions do they see? What do they see in terms of the animals? Well, you know, one that just keeps sticking out in my mind and we put her on the cover of our report is a, a mother boxer that Missouri State inspectors in- took a photograph of this dog when they went in to inspect this facility called Rocky Top Canines, which has been in our report this year for the eighth time. Wow. This dog, you can see every rib. You can see her spinal, the bumps along her spine. You can see the structure of her hips. She is so emaciated. In front of her in this picture, there's an empty bowl and five two-week-old puppies. Mm. And the authorities did not seize this dog. Uh, They simply required the breeder to have her evaluated by a vet within two days and left the property. Wow. And not only is this breeder licensed and legal in Missouri to this day, but she's also USDA licensed. And that means that she can ship her puppies to anyone in the country, uh, an unlimited number. She can ship to Internet buyers or to pet stores. Mm -hmm. Um, And she's been in business for many, many years. And the the. It's just appalling that that this dog was not seized and that the USDA didn't even cite for anything related to this dog. Wow. And, so uh, this yeah. is, I mean, Kathleen, this is, that's just so sad to hear. And I think that like, here is where I feel like we should make the sort of connection for folks about, you know, without knowing it, many dog lovers who are out there trying to find a puppy for their family Maybe by buying an animal on the internet, by going to a pet store, may accidentally be supporting a place like that where without them knowing it, they could be getting a puppy whose mom is continuing to be kept in those conditions. Right. And they may think that they're doing their homework by saying, well, I I found out that this is an AKC breeder. I found out that this is a USDA licensed breeder. I found out that this is a state licensed breeder. Mm -hmm. This this breeder claims to be all of these things. Mm, wow. And, and yet this this dog in the condition that she was in, and I encourage anyone to go look at humanesociety.org slash horrible hundred and they'll see the photo. If you or I had that dog in our home and a neighbor mm-hmm. called the humane law enforcement on us, I'm pretty sure we would be in court and the dog would no longer be living in our home. The dog would be confiscated. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. why is this not happening in in America's licensed breeding facilities? It's um, it's really a, a shame. Yeah, yeah. And and so um, these places, like, where are they selling these animals to? Like, like, is it is it? Are there particular pet stores? Are there? I mean, are is it? Are there particular websites that cater to these breeders? I mean, is it? Do they do they do it knowingly or is it? you know, blind or? Yeah, it's really all over. Um, Mm -hmm. We, 
about half of the breeders in our report are licensed to sell to pet stores and many others are probably selling to pet stores anyway mm-hmm. without that license. Uh, we found at least 12 of the breeders in our report are selling to Petland Pet Stores, which is the biggest chain of puppy selling pet stores in the country. Mm-hmm. Um, and Petland claims that all of their breeders are top notch, top 2% of breeders in the country. Uh, they claim that they inspect their own breeders. And also they claim that they don't sell from breeders with severe violations. Mm. Um, but one of the things we found when we look at the Missouri State reports for places like Rocky Top Canines is that many of the breeders with horrific state violations the, are are not being found with the same violations when USDA inspects. Mm. And mm-hmm. Pet, Petland is only looking at the USDA reports. Interesting. So is is that a sign that the USDA inspections are just sort of not actually doing the job? Like, what does that tell us? Uh, well, unfortunately, it's true. I mean, that USDA only goes to each facility maybe once a year. They're not even required to go once a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and their standards are very, very low. Uh, they The licensed breeders can keep dogs in, in small wire cages that are stacked one on top of another. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's completely legal under USDA standards. They only need to have six inches around their body. Um, And another issue that we have with USDA is that they allow breeders to have a written vet care plan. So sometimes if USDA goes out and sees a dog who is underweight, uh, they could tell the breeder, well, you need to do something about this underweight dog. And the breeder can just either refer to a written care plan or call their vet and say, well, my inspector says this dog is underweight. What do you want me to do? Mm-hmm. And the vet can say, feed the dog more often. Hmm. And then that's it. They don't get a violation for it. Wow. And that, as we all know, uh, those of us who have dogs in our homes, if your dog is losing weight, it could be due to an infection. It could be due to something they ate that caused an intestinal blockage or very, very commonly due to parasites. Um, mm-hmm. But there's no testing required of ailing Mm. animals under Mm. USDA's rules. Yeah. So there's this frequent discussion around sort of uh, the the term poor breeding and, you know, hearing you talk about the conditions on, on, at these mills, you know, like just the idea of a mother dog being kept in this, in this situation. I mean, that's one kind of poor breeding, but, but when we're talking about poor breeding, you're talking about these sort of diseases and things. Can you talk a little bit more about like what things you see in terms of the animals that these mills are producing in terms of medical conditions and things? Uh, you, do you mean genetic conditions, yeah. for example? Yeah. Well, I think you and I know we have a colleague who adopted uh, a puppy. It, she was a puppy mill puppy who was, conf- well, I wouldn't say confiscated, but given up by a pet store that we investigated Mm-hmm. at HSUS. And it was found that the pet store had not lawfully obtained this dog. And uh, we obtained three of these puppies that the pet store was required to give up. Mm-hmm. And one of our colleagues adopted one of these dogs. Her name is Rosie. Mm-hmm. She was a Morky. She is a Morky. She's still alive. Don't worry. <laughs> mm-hmm. But um, before she was a year old, she had to have a very expensive hip surgery. Mm. Because And the vet said, this is because of poor breeding. This is you know, a genetic condition that had the the parents, pro- one of the parents probably had it. And mm-hmm. uh, she was not even able to walk properly without this surgery. And of course, mm-hmm. our colleagues being great animal lovers made sure she got the, the treatment that she needed. Uh, but, you know, it cost that family thousands of dollars and, wow. and a lot of pain and suffering to the animal. Thank goodness she's okay now. Yeah. But I mean, I have I have just such a rescue in my own home, as you know. Um, and you know, he's got he's got all sorts of little issues. His mouth doesn't close right. His little his little patellas are luxating. I mean, he's a he's a walking mess. I love him, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to see the uh, the sort of genetic predisposition stuff on on the on the fluster. That'd be uh, yes. interesting to see. Um, you know, we, we no, just put ahead. out a report on fifteen years of puppy buyer complaints we've received. And uh, those luxating patellas, a.k.a. bad knees, is one of the things we hear about really commonly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and and what what could be, I mean, if, if a breeder wanted to do better about that, like, what should they be doing? Well, a, a truly responsible breeder, of course, wouldn't sell to pet stores at all, but mm-hmm. um, yeah. they will have the parents screened. Now, of course, you can't get every dog screened for every possible disease that they mm, right. might yeah. get. But if if you have a dog like a Labrador that's prone to hip dysplasia, you a responsible breeder would not dream of breeding that animal without having the hips x-rayed. 
and mm-hmm. certified as as sound. Yeah. Um, and if if for some reason a, an issue popped up later that the breeder wasn't able to test for, but later found out that the the mother dog had it or the father dog had it uh, and it could be passed along to the puppies, then they would spay or neuter that dog and place them as a pet and not breed them anymore. Mm, right, right. So in terms of like the people we hear from who, you know, often unknowingly end up getting a puppy mill dog who has these health conditions, like like what kind of we we collect sort of buyer complaints, right? I mean, can you talk a little bit about some of the things that you have your team has heard from from people who have gotten a, a dog that turned out to be a puppy mill dog? Well, the list is so long. Mm-hmm. Um, there's uh, there's a woman I'm thinking of right now that we're trying to get some legal help for who bought a dog from a Petland store in Texas. And the dog started having seizure like episodes almost as soon as she took her home. Wow. And she immediately called the store and said that there's something wrong with the dog and the store didn't help her. And uh, she ended up, the dog only lived for a year. The dog had seizures and other problems ongoing for the entire time she had the dog. Mm -hmm. And the store did not make it right. So not only did this family go deep into debt, trying to save the life of their animal with sky high vet bills, sky high price for the dog, which, you know, we advise people to go to an animal shelter and and get a a much less expensive dog um, who's Mm -hmm. more likely to be healthy. But not only did she spend thousands of dollars on vet bills and on the price of the dog, but she was also signed up for some exorbitant loan rates that she wasn't quite aware of how much she was paying. And one of those loans was 133%. Wow. So she now Holy owes- cow. That is incredible. So we're seeing sort of the conjoining of two exploitive industries here. Two how exploitive nice. industries. Right. Um, and Predatory she loans was and puppy mills. Great. Very badly mm-hmm. emotionally wounded as well as financially um, wounded. And, you know, when she wrote her complaint to us, she said, um, I pay, I, I owe $7,000 for ashes. No. She has nothing. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. Oh, poor woman. Um, poor woman, poor dog. Yeah. It's a very exploitative industry. And of course, she, Going back to the puppy mill situation, she didn't know this dog came from a puppy mill. Of course, mm-hmm. most people that go to pet stores are are told that these are these are very high quality breeders, and when they see the prices of these dogs, they believe it. They see, well, I'm being charged three or four thousand dollars. This must be a high quality dog, right? Right, and they and and folks use terms like you know the dog has his papers, and I mm-hmm. mean, like, can you talk a little bit about like what having one's papers means? Well, having having papers on a dog just means that the mother and the father of that dog were the same breed um, and, mm-hmm. and somebody certified that. So somebody sent in paperwork. If your dog is a Great Dane, um, somebody sent paperwork, say, to the AKC. Here's the papers proving mom was a Great Dane. Here's the papers proving dad was a Great Dane. Mm-hmm. Could it been a mom? Could it have been a mama who had hip dysplasia and, you know, uh, all uh, uh, bad knees and a bad heart and a bad liver, it, all all of the above. Mm-hmm. Yes, the the, yeah. the papers are no indication of quality or health in the dog, and they're also no indication that the dog came from a a, a sound and humane facility. Mm-hmm. So generally, like, what is our recommendation around? I mean, if if people are seeking to add a family member. Obviously, like we've been sort of preaching shelter adoption for years. I mean, it sounds like you might have gone to a shelter recently. Can you tell people like what to expect when they go to a shelter? Sure. We were at the shelter, our local shelter, about a week ago to donate some supplies. And shelters are very, very full of dogs right now across the mm-hmm. country. Yeah. Many of them are large dogs. Uh, but we we saw there was an English bulldog there for adoption. Uh, mm-hmm. there was, there was three chihuahuas. There was a, a cocker spaniel. There was a husky, um, of course, many wonderful pit bull type boxer type dogs, um, a, a really wide variety of dogs. In fact, mm-hmm. we, we have a Shih Tzu at home who came from a shelter and, um, two chihuahuas also shelter dogs. Well, one of them was a shelter dog. One of them was uh, a rescue from Puerto Rico, but, um, mm-hmm. but yes, I, I, I prefer small dogs myself. And I know Mm -hmm. some people tell us it's hard to get a small dog from a shelter, but they're there there. And there's more there now than there were three years ago when during the pandemic, when everybody went out and adopted dogs, you know, left and right. And Mm -hmm. and the shelters maybe didn't have as many. 
uh, but they are very full again. And I would really encourage people who who want a dog of any kind to to visit their local shelter. Right. Um, so Kathleen, you know, and aside, if someone goes to their local shelter and can't find, you know, for whatever reason, they don't find a dog that they they connect with, they don't find the right animal for them. Like, if they do make a choice to go to a breeder, like, what are some some basic sort of guardrails that that we recommend around, like, how to make sure that they are not supporting a mill like these places that are described in the horrible hundred report year after year? Right. Well, number one, you want to meet that breeder in person. You can not believe it's like it's like the mm-hmm. internet dating you cannot believe what people right. tell you right, right? Yeah. And, yeah don't um, go by their uh by their uh don't go by that Tinder bio or yeah. Tinder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um no you have to meet them in person mm-hmm. and make sure that um they're legitimate uh you want to meet the mother and possibly the father of the dog but at least the mother of the dog um and make sure that those dogs are living in a home-like environment that's healthy and clean and, uh, you know, another red flag f- with you want to make sure your breeder doesn't have is that they shouldn't have an unlimited amount of puppies all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, a good breeder breeds very, very sparingly. And, you know, they may say, well, I don't have puppies right now, but I'm expecting a litter mm-hmm. in two months. Right. And, right. you know, then they'll keep in touch with you. And um, they'll a- also will ask you questions to make sure that that you're a suitable home, that this is the right type of dog for you. Mm hmm. Um, so Kathleen, in talking about the horrible hundred, you know, I think one of the things our listeners will probably want to know is where does their state fall in terms of, of where, you know, like how many, how many problem mills, is this a problem in their own communities? So if you could, um, if you could share again, like if people want to learn a little bit about the horrible hundred, um, you know, what breeders were on it this year, where they're sort of like really sort of hot spots, what's the, what's the right spot to go for them to learn more about this report? It's humanesociety.org slash horrible hundred. Well, thank you so much for I know that this this pulling this report together is always just a tremendous challenge. I think that, you know, like, stop me if I'm wrong, but it's become slightly less of a challenge now that we we have a little bit more uh, transparency from the USDA on some of this stuff again, because for a few years there was, you know, they obliterated all this documentation. Right. Right. So at least it's at least we can, you know, get the information, even though we're not happy always with what we find in it. But. Yeah. Congratulations on on the report. And hopefully we will see some results this year from it, as we always tend to. Yes. Thank you. Hopefully some of the ones that are on the list this year will not be in business by the next time the report comes out. That would be great. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being here for another episode of Humane Voices. Kathleen, thank you for your time. And we'll see you next episode. 